Hello everyone and welcome to the first ever Couchless video on my channel. Now, uh, there's a very good reason why the couch behind me is missing, but it's it's a fairly long story, so I, I will maybe tell it if you're interested uh, in a week when the couch returns. Now, getting back to this game, uh, it's the final round of the Gashimov Memorial. Uh, Carlsen has already won the tournament, so this is just uh, a game where he can either uh, improve his rating performance, you know, get, get a few more rating points, uh, but all in all, the tournament standings are not all that important to him anymore. Here he faces Alexander Grishuk, and Grishuk mentioned in the previous video uh, that uh, he was very sad that Karakin lost his game like that, because now there is no chance for anyone to catch up to Magnus, uh, but at least he now gets a crack at the world champion. So, without further ado, let's check out the game. Uh, it's a very nice line of the Berlin, where Carlsen and chooses a, a very rare a line. Uh, so let's check it out. Uh, Carlsen opens with e4. Uh, we have e5, knight to f3, knight to c6, and bishop to b5. Now, Dury Lopez is on the board. Uh, we have knight to f6, and now d3. Uh, and of course, bishop to c5, the, the most common played line of the Berlin today. c3 by Carlsen, preparing the early retreat of the bishop via, uh, via bishop to a4 and c2. Uh, we have castles by Grishuk, now comes castles by Carlsen, d6, and now immediately bishop to a4. Uh, we have knight to e7 by Grishuk, remaneuvering the knight over to g6, uh, and now uh, right away bishop to c2 by Carlsen. Uh, here there is uh, there are three moves known in this position, uh, as it's uh, not all that uh, uh, often played line. Uh, but uh, the most notable game from this position is uh, Ka Sergei Karakin versus Dmitry Akovenko, where knight b to d2 was played, uh, and Karakin was able to win this game uh, in last year's uh, World Blitz Championship in, in St. Petersburg. Uh, but here Carlsen goes bishop to c2. So it's only move 8, but already Carlsen went bishop b5 to a4 to c2. Uh, this is, uh, if you're a beginner, uh, you shouldn't touch your pieces more than once in the opening. Uh, but uh, if, if you're, you know, very familiar with the line, then it's okay. Uh, knight to g6. Uh, and by the way, bishop to c2 is a new move in the position, which is on move 8 for the Berlin defense, uh, a very rare thing. Uh, and for the Rui Lopez in general. Uh, Grishuk continues knight to g6 as planned, and now d4. Uh, Grishuk is not interested in capturing in the center, he doesn't want to make it easy for Carlsen, so retreating with the bishop, bishop b6, uh, and now a4, grabbing space on the queen side, also a5 uh, will come. c6, making an escape route for the bishop if Carlsen does push a5, uh, and now pawn captures on e5. We have knight captures, knight captures, pawn captures, and here Carlsen can choose whether he wants to trade queens or maybe uh, keep the queens on the board, uh, but he already won the tournament, he plays queen captures on d8. Uh, we have rook captures on d8, and now comes a5, uh, just pushing that bishop back, we have bishop, not to c7, although it seems like a very nice square, but perhaps Grishuk did not uh, find it all that impressive since his pawn is on e5, blocking the nice dark square bishop, so bishop to c5. Uh, we have knight to d2 by Carlsen, he continues development, uh, bishop to e6, and now comes rook to e1. Uh, rook to e1 is a nice move, uh, because it uh, it gives Grishuk the opportunity to go bishop uh, knight to g4 to put some threats along the, uh, the f-pawn, where Carlsen could either go rook f1 and then Grishuk could repeat, hoping for uh, for a nice draw, uh, but also Carlsen, uh, Carlsen can just uh, guard the pawn via rook to e2, so uh, that is possible, but then he constantly has to keep an eye uh, on the light square bishop if it will harass the rook. Uh, but okay, after rook e1, uh, Grishuk goes b5, he also wants to expand on the queen side, and perhaps if Carlsen Carlsen is interested in trading, then even uh, trade rooks along the A-file, uh, but Carlsen just repeats uh, knight to b3, forces the bishop to move back, uh, or um, uh, or allows the bishop captures on b3. Here, uh, Grishuk decides to give up the bishop pair. We have bishop captures on b3, we have bishop captures on b3, and now knight to g4, piling up on the f2 pawn. Uh, and here, uh, if Carlsen goes rook back to f1, most likely Grishuk would just uh, repeat knight to f6, so Carlsen goes rook to e2. It's not a problem, as there's no uh, no danger of rook d1, since the bishop is covering the d1 square. Uh, we have rook to d6, Grishuk now hopes to double rooks along the d-file, uh, but first we have bishop to g5. Carlsen de develops his dark square bishop, also guards the d8 square, so rook to d8, sorry, uh, so rook to d8 will not be possible. Uh, we have king to f8 now. You still can't push f6 to push the bishop back as there's this very annoying pin. So first Grishuk breaks the pin. Uh, king to f8 and now comes rook to, rook to f1. 
Uh, also, you could play something like h3, but black will just ignore you. Black can go h6 or f6, and then, uh, well, we, uh, well, we will probably get the same position as in the game. Uh, rook to f1 by Carlsen, uh, preparing uh, g3, king g2, and f4. Uh, we have knight back to f6 by Grishuk. You could also play f6, but then just bishop to c1. Yes, you've kicked the dark square bishop back, but you do now have this, uh, well, a monster light square bishop, and you don't have uh, a light square bishop yourself to, to oppose Carlsen's light square bishop, so you don't want to allow this. Uh, so instead of creating any weaknesses in front of your king, knight back to f6. Uh, we have g3. Uh, as planned, uh, Carlson wants to go king g2 and f4. Uh, we have a6 by Grishuk and now king to g2. Uh, knight back to d7 and now bishop back to c1. Carlson wants uh, his bishop to be behind the f4 pawn when he pushes it. He doesn't want to lock it in with f4. So bishop to c1, bishop back to a7. Grishuk also wants to push on the queen side and now f4. And here Carlson puts on an additional defender uh, to, the, to, the f, uh, to the e5 pawn. So he plays f6. Uh, again, uh, seemingly one of the positions where it is okay to play f6, and Carlsen goes h4. He now wants to grab even more space on the king side. Uh, we have rook to e8, uh, uh, defending yet again the e5 pawn, uh, overprotecting it, if you will. Uh, we have h5 by Carlsen, and now h6, not allowing the pawn to create even more weaknesses by being pushed all the way to h6. Uh, bishop to a2 by Carlsen, uh, with ideas of going bishop to b1, as there are some very interesting lines here, uh, which uh, probably Carlsen prepared already even here. Uh, but okay, we have c5, and here uh, Carlsen decides to sacrifice a pawn, and it's a very nice pawn sacrifice because it gives white a lot of activity, and since Grishuk is in time trouble, which I know what you're thinking, uh, Grishuk is always in time trouble, that's not really a big deal. Uh, but, you know, it, it is a big deal if it's a complicated position and you have to act quickly. So Carlsen goes bishop to e3. He prevents any expansion on the queen side because the bishop on a7 is unguarded. Uh, but uh, Grishuk accepts the pawn sacrifice. We have e captures on f4, pawn captures on f4, and now rook captures on e4. And here, uh, the bishop now comes to b1, uh, forcing the rook to move back. Uh, rook to e7 is played, and now Carlsen's bishop bear, pair will be very strong. Uh, here we have rook um, f to e1. Here Carlsen doubles up on the e-file, uh, and the Grishuk now has to decide how to do, uh, what to do. His bishop isn't doing all that much. The knight isn't really all that impressive. He is up a pawn, but he still has to uh, mobilize his pieces to... Uh, well, to, to more impressive squares. Here, knight to b8 would have been the best idea, followed by knight to c6, and from there you can uh, continue just, you know, building up the position. Uh, but uh, he decides to give back the pawn to immediately uh, put his pieces on better squares. He plays f5, gives back the f-pawn, and now he wants to use the f6 square for the knight and go all the way to d5. So here, Carlsen accepts the, the you know, uh, the pawn sacrifice back. Uh, we have knight to f6 and now just king to f3 by Carlsen. Uh, here Grishuk replies with knight to d5, just piling up on the bishop on e3, but knight to d5 doesn't work. And uh, knight to d5 actually loses the game for Grishuk, but feel free to pause the video and try to find a move that, uh, well, takes advantage of this um, uh, in inaccuracy by, by Grishuk. Uh, I'll give you a couple of seconds if you're interested in, in uh, maybe try, uh, giving it a go. Uh, for those of you who were able to do it, congratulations, you are an excellent tactician. And for those of you who just want to enjoy the show, uh, the move is rook to d2. Just notice that the rook on d6 is unguarded. The knight can never move. And you can attack the knight all you want. You can go rook d1, you can go bishop to e4. It will be very hard for black to defend this as, I mean, it's it's very obvious when you have all the time in the world. But Grishuk, in severe time trouble, uh, he missed this, uh, this uh, idea. Uh, so he goes rook back to d8. Uh, uh, now preparing for, for Carlsen's onslaught on the d5 square. Bishop to e4 by Carlsen and now just rook e to d7 as the bishop is no longer controlling the d7 square, uh, but Carlsen just attacks it again. We have rook e to d1, uh, and now how do you defend it? You play knight to f6, but uh, it doesn't work. The thing you had to realize when you played rook to d2 is the weak a6 pawn, and here Carlsen really takes advantage of it. He plays rook captures on d7, and now if you exchange everything, if you go rook captures, 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 and then bishop to b7, uh, the whole queen side pawn structure falls apart and you will have a winning endgame. 
So here Grishuk tried knight captures on d7, but it doesn't matter, Carlsen just played uh, rook to d6, and now there's again no way to defend the a6 pawn, once the a6 pawn falls, it's the base of the pawn chain, all the other pawns will follow, and it's an easy winning endgame for, for Magnus Carlsen. Uh, so yeah, uh, what to say, uh, brilliant uh, third in a row victory for Magnus Carlsen who finishes this tournament, uh, all the other games have ended as well, uh, so I will show the standings, these are the standings, as you can see Carlsen wins the tournament uh, with two points ahead of everyone else, so Magnus Carlsen seven points, uh, Ding Liren uh, in second place followed by Karakin also with five points in third place, then with four and a half we have three people, uh, Alexander Grishuk after losing this game to Carlsen, Vishwanathan Anand, Timur Rajabov, uh, then with four points, uh, Veselin Topalov and David Navara, and with three and a half, Shahrir Mamedyarov. And unbelievable, but uh, a former member of the 2800 club, Anish Giri, uh, in the last place with only three points. Uh, but as we already mentioned, someone always has to have uh, a bad tournament if others are to win some points, uh, which is what happened to Giri this tournament. But he's playing another tournament fairly soon, so I think he already forgot about this uh, event and, you know, he, he's just moving forward. Uh, with life and everything, which is definitely the way to go. Everyone can have a bad tournament, but then you just have to uh, pick yourself up and say, okay, there are more games to be played. Uh, so yeah, uh, that's the game. I do hope you enjoyed it. Really, really an impressive tournament by Carlsen, who who uh, won it the fourth time. This is the fourth edition of the Shamkir Chess Tournament. He won all four, and this time he won it with a, with a two-point uh, lead. And uh, yeah, his rating performance in this tournament is almost 3,000. And um, in, in the live rating, he, he has now climbed above 2860. So he's getting closer and closer to, the, to, his, um, uh, to his highest highest ever rating, which I believe was uh, 2882. Uh, so who knows if he continues this uh, up until the end of the year, uh, he could he could very well be the first person to uh, to break 2900. But it's uh, it's um, uh, really an, uh, uh, it seems like impossible because if you just lose one game, then you know you have to win like five games just to make up for that one. So it's uh, it's really really hard. I, I don't think it will be possible just yet. But you know maybe maybe next year when more people will feed into the rating system where, where when there will be a lot more rating on top then perhaps uh, you know more players will, will start breaking uh, 2900 maybe not next year maybe I said a bit too soon for Carlson maybe but for others maybe in a, in a five years range uh, but yeah uh, so yeah, uh, that's the game. I do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I will consider showing some other games. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, well, feel free to suggest uh, some other games if you're interested in checking up in this tournament. A lot of you have suggested Ding Liren versus Tapala where, where Ding just squeezes the blood out of stone. Uh, but... Uh, it's uh, it's really not uh, th there's nothing to show there uh, how to put it which would uh, sh uh, which would educate you or show you something or or even make it en entertaining. It's just uh, Ding's incredible willpower that that allowed him to to tackle that. Uh, but yeah, uh, I would like to thank Dame Pletvaric, uh, Harshit Rai, uh, Timo Salo, Harrison Bodri, and Paul Staples for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot, I really appreciate it. Uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and I will see you soon, uh, hopefully with some more interesting content, uh, hopefully with a couch behind me, and uh, you know, I, I will tell you that story once the couch returns, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see about that. Uh, so thank you all, I will see you soon, and have an excellent rest of your day.